Perhaps the last set of bug eyes to come along were on the North American P, later F, 82. Originally designed as a very long range escort by using common parts from the P 51. The twin Mustang would have protected US B 29 bombers on extra long flights across the Pacific. The missions may have been so long that layback seats were considered for the twin Mustangs. The double fuselage did provide challenges for the designers at North American Aviation. And it also intrigued Army scientists at Wright Patterson because it presented a very different layout which might have unknown problems both in aerodynamics and in terms of crew orientation. The P-82 was not exactly the same as a conventional twin-boom aircraft, like the P-38 Lightning, where the pilot is positioned right on the center line. In the P-82, whichever side was in control would always be off-center. There was also concern about the disconnect factor of having two pilots being completely separated. This was something the Army Aeromedicine team wanted to know more about. On the other hand, the twin Mustang concept could be put into the air quickly, although in actual fact the P-82 used surprisingly few parts from its P-51 cousin, something that was borne out by the price. The twin Mustangs cost four times the amount of a single P-51, although on one level both aircraft were exactly the same, with each type taking just 90 days from drawing to prototype, and on both occasions that was exactly what was needed. All told, 270 F-82s were built, with many serving as night fighters patrolling U.S. borders after the war until the early jets arrived. As it happened, the twin Mustangs layout was not all that popular with pilots, perhaps confirming Hap Arnold's original instinct. One of the pilots who flew the Mustang was Bud Anderson. Today, he is the highest ranking living American fighter ace with 16 and a quarter air victories in the skies over Europe. After the war, Anderson became a test pilot at Wright Field in Ohio and what later became Edwards Air Force Base. One of the planes he flew in test was the XP-82, an attempt to make the P-51 into two P-51s. Anderson is quoted as saying, quote, the thinking back then was, well, if one Mustang was great, Let's put two together. It's got to be better." Unquote. Well, that didn't work out. Maybe a good idea, but that's why design ideas turn into test flight. What works and what doesn't, what test flight is all about. Tom Riley is a master restorer of this XP-82. Ray Fowler is a master pilot. He has flown three tours in the F-16 in Iraq and Afghanistan and flew the XP-82. He can and does fly almost, if not all, of the airplanes parked here at EAA. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Here we go. Uh, I'm David Hartman. Thank you for being with us this morning. Hi. Thanks. Right here. Right here. Yep. And this is Tom Riley in front of me. Welcome, Tom. This is his airplane. And Ray Fowler. And Ray, you just heard his bio a couple of moments ago. So, good morning, all. Tom, with your experience and your years of over 40 years of restoring airplanes and 34 or more that you've restored, how unique was this experience for you compared to the other ones that you had restoring aircraft? I've always been a bomber guy. I've, I've flown a Mustang, flown a TBM, and so forth like that, but I've always been a bomber guy. I fly B-17s, B-25s, 24. I went to the, uh, in 1992, I was invited to go to see the Soplata collection in Newbury, Ohio. And I went up there, and I walked in, and it was an amazing collection of airplanes that Mr. and Mrs. Soplata, Walter and Margaret Soplata, put together. And, uh, I was looking for bombers, and I saw the F-82E model 
82, sitting there all intact. And I immediately fell in love with that airplane. So F, F-82, for those of you who don't know, during World War II, it, P for pursuit, but that switched in 47 or 48, I think, to F for fighter. So that's why F-82 is what yeah. we're talking about. When, why, where was this airplane designed? This was the, the stopgap for the P-51 Mustang after the P-51 Mustang. The original Mustang was escorting B-29s from Saipan or Tinian, one of the out islands to Japan. We were losing a lot of Mustangs because they were f- fuel short. Uh, they were carrying underwing fuel. But the B-29s were cruise at 330. The Mustang would cruise at 280 approximately. And they would, coming back to Saipan, there were a lot of them in the bottom of the ocean because they ran out of fuel. They came to North America in November 43 and asked Edgar Schmu, the head designer of the Mustang, who back in 1940, when he was designing the Mustang, he hand-sketched a twin-engine Mustang. And his boss came to him and says, if you're going to doodle, you're going to work for Lockheed or Boeing or something like that. So he just put it in his top draw. I forgot, didn't forget about it, but it was there. So in 1943, Hap Arnold came and said, we need a twin-engine Mustang that's 50 faster, carries X amount of fuel, and has six hours longer range to escort the 29s. He pulled his draw out and says, how about this? Hap Arnold looked at it and said, build it. This is November 43. And they had it first finished. This is the first to fly on, on, on a 15 April 45. So how many of these were built? <clears throat> there were 272 built. There were 22. Uh, there were two XPs. Uh, this is the second XP, but the first to flight because we can prove it was the first flight because there was only one one-hour flight with up-sweeping propellers. Right now, you can see the pitch on the props. They're down-sweeping. There was one flight, and they couldn't make it fly. They kept going to the end of the runway at, at, at takeoff power. It would not lift off. It was because it was the up-sweeping props would, would, would create an up-sweep of air over the top of the center section and the slab size of the fuselage trapped the air, bubbled the air, made it into a stall, which is not a stall when an engine stops, a stall is when it stops flying. So the center section wouldn't fly. So they eventually unloaded most all the fuel out of it. They had 150 gallons of fuel, which gave them an hour, an hour and a little bit. And they yanked it off the runway at the end. It flew great when they pulled the throttle back. When they pushed the throttle forward, it was in a stall configuration, so it would stumble. So they took hundreds of pictures of the airplane with up-sweeping props, you know, on the, on the second serial number. But it was the first one off the assembly line. So we can prove this was the first to fly. So how many of these airplanes actually saw any combat? They saw combat in Korea. They could not get on production prior to the aircraft uh, uh, before the war was was over or they took over closer islands where the Mustangs could successfully escort the 29s. So how effective were they in Korea? They shot the first three airplanes down. Wow. And how long did that last, that they continued to use this airplane in they, Korea? They used the, the 23rd and on, which were E models or later versions. The, the backing up a little bit, there were two prototypes, which were Merlin powered, and then there were 20 B models which were Merlin-powered. And then they built 250 uh, Allison-powered ones, which are the ones that saw the combat. So how long did they stay in combat? In the, from the very beginning of the war until probably... Uh, this is like 1950? 1950, 51, they were replaced by F-86 Sabres. And that's when the, the MiGs and the Sabres... The MiGs, yeah. And, uh, but they shot down the first three airplanes. Now in 1953, they all went to scrap. They, all they, of them? Well, all but five. There, there, are, there are two that are in the Air Force Museum, which are B models, which, which are Merlin powered. That's in Dayton. And, and one of them is, is Betty Jo that flew nonstop from Hawaii all the way to LaGuardia. It could have gone to Iceland. It was, it was, uh, it was uh, 5,020 miles. Could have gone to Iceland, but they could not drop three of the four drop tanks. Someone had tightened down the soy braces. 
So they were stuck on their hooks. So it was full right rudder all the way and dragging along the drop tank. They still averaged 340 miles an hour going across the country. So how many of these airplanes were scrapped? All but five? All, all but five. There's one at Lackland Air Force Base, and Allison powered one on static display. There's one flyer right here. There's one flyer. There's a second one being restored by Pat Harker in Anoka, Minnesota, doing a magnificent job. His is Allison powered. And, and there's only two in civilian hands. And they, they were both saved from NACA, which was the predecessor of NASA. <clears throat> now, it, uh, this one went to NASA in July 1945, and it shot more bullets and dropped more bombs and rockets. Than Out of Edwards or no, Eglin? No, it was in Cleveland, Ohio. In Cleveland. It was in, based in Cleveland. Right. So uh, in, in November 49, it landed on an icy runway, skidded off the side, and, and buried a wheel in the ice and the mud and bent the center section. <clears throat> and Walter Sablata, who had been collecting airplanes for quite a while... Now, who is Walter Sablata? Yeah. Walter Sablata is a man that saved so many of these airplanes. And by the way, his, his daughter, Sister Margaret, right there, and uh, uh, S Sister Mary... And, and Margaret sitting in front of her, or the two daughters of Walter wow. and Margaret Saplata sitting right there. So anyway, Walter saved 30-some-odd airplanes in his backyard. He would, he would go anywhere there was an airplane that was not going to fly anymore. He would take it apart and bring it to his farm there in Newbury, Ohio. Still has a bunch of airplanes there. So anyway... Scattered <clears throat> all over everywhere? No, they're all in one area. They're, <laughs> yeah. So anyway, uh, he went up there, and the, the scrappers there in Ohio, at, at Cleveland, were getting ready to very, well, they very carefully took it apart with a chainsaw. Oh, the, the airplane was being scrapped. So Walter bought it. He paid $300 for it. Didn't get the engines, didn't get the propellers, but he got everything else. So anyway, he brought it home to his farm, and a couple months later, I think that's the time frame, NACA came back and says, we need the airplane back. Why? All these 82s are going to Korea, and they have to be tested to destruction. So he worked out a deal. They gave him an F-84, Thunder, Thunder, Thunder Streak, something like that. Gave him an F-84, and they took back the whole airplane except for the left fuselage. This one, right back there. So they traded him. They traded them. Yeah. So they took the whole airplane back, except for the left fuselage, and it didn't have the tail section. They took the wings, the center section, which had been cut, and the, t the rear fuselages, the horizontal and the verticals. And they tested destruction, and we thought all that was gone forever. <clears throat> so anyway, I went up there uh, in 2000, after falling in love with the 82, the E-Model 82, which was... Uh, back camp a little bit. I sold a B-17 in 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 uh, in uh, in '97, and I had the money in my pocket. And I went up to the Splatters and I said I would like to buy that '82. We sold it two days ago, oh. and I didn't know I didn't know another '82 existed, other than in the museums. So another ten years went by, and I was invited up there to do an IRS appraisal on an airplane in 2007. And I came across this fuselage sitting underneath some tin on the side of a, like on the side of a building. And at, I said, at Walter's house? At Walter's farm, yes. Yeah. So uh, I asked him, I said, I didn't know you had another Mustang. Now, it didn't have a tail section on it. So, and it, they put a 59-inch plug in it, make it longer. But that part was gone because they didn't have a tail <coughs> section. So I said, I would like to buy this airplane from you. They said, well, it's not for sale. This is December 23rd and sloshing through the snow. Oh, 2007? 2007. I said, I would like to buy this airplane from you. That's not for sale. And, and, um, and he had all the parts taken off. He was able to take all, any parts that he could unbolt off of the, the, left, the right hand fuselage, he took and put it in the house. So he had, all the, he had a lot of parts there. So. And, it, and, about th and I knew I was going to be able to buy the airplane. They said, we, we know we should have sold you the other airplane, but we didn't. And we, we didn't hear from you for a number of years, so we figured you had disappeared. Which, so anyway, 
uh, he says, we promise, uh, Miss Margaret, the, the wife, I always called her Miss Margaret, she, uh, she did most of the dealing, or all the, all the dealing. So she called me in March, approximately, or April 2008. She said, well, come on up, we're ready to sell it. And this is the strange part. She had been offered, and I usually don't talk money, but she was offered $30,000 for the fuselage. And I said to her, I said, it's worth a lot more than that. So okay. So from December until March, April, I went to anywhere in the country that I knew that I had parts. There was a crash in Alaska. Don Whittington had a bunch of stuff out of the scrap yard in Fairbanks where they had scrapped the remaining 1382s that went to Alaska, which were H models with heated leading edge and all that to operate in Alaska to guard against the Russians coming across. But in 53, they're all scrapped. He went up there after that and bought a bunch of parts. And then there's a woman in, in uh, St. Pete that had a canopy and another man in... In, in Florida? In Florida. St. Pete, yeah, in Florida. Florida. Yeah. Another man in North Carolina had a canopy. And that was unique. Someone tried to buy that canopy from us. So we'll give you thousands of dollars for a canopy. He says, no. He says, it's going to go to this airplane because I know it's going to go on. I said, well, how much do you want for it? He said, it's free if it's going to go on the airplane. Wow. <laughs> so I went, uh, they called me in March or April and I went up there. And they said... Uh, I said, well, how much do you want for the airplane? She said, well, it's $60,000. And I say, what does that mean? I said, it's worth more than that, knowing Walter had all the parts. I could not make Walter upset because he was upset about a previous sale to a Corsair. So I just figured he's the only person that's got the parts. So I, I held my figure up. She said, what does that mean? I said, it's worth more than that. And Walter said, never had anybody offer me more than something was, that I asked for. I'll tell you when to stop. Well, so the figure went to 80, 100. And I, I said, okay. I wrote him a check. He went throughout the house. He said, the landing gear is here. The, the, the hydraulics are over here. The belly scoop is down in the coal cellar. You know, here and there. He had, he had endless parts. So he gathered up all the parts, put them in a container, shipped the airplane home, contracted with all the people to put down payments to for all the other parts, got all them back, and I was, and then Walter would find more parts, Margaret would find more parts, and they'd call me, and I'd come up there with my truck and pick them up. And while I was up there, I looked underneath a pile of scrap B-52 parts. I said, they look like Mustang parts. There were the remaining 80T parts that had come back from NACA after they had crushed them. So I ended up with a complete about airplane. This, about from the same airplane originally? Same airplane. The so I ended up getting all the rest of the parts. Now, some of them were usable. A lot of them weren't because they had been run over by a bulldozer. But between going throughout the world looking for 82 parts and making a whole bunch, we ended up with a complete airplane. So then you went to work to put this together. What was that process like? Well, we hired a bunch of sheet metal people. And it was, we're a sheet metal shop. And uh, uh, we worked on it for 11 and a half years. In the meantime, more people would read about, we'd have a new monthly news, re news release that would go out. And then people would hear about it. They'd say, we have a throttle quadrant. We have this, we have that. Everything is magical about this airplane. Virtually nothing has gone wrong. Uh, one instance, I was walking into the crash site in Alaska. We could land the helicopter one, one spot on a 363 circle. There are only five parts on this airplane that are the same as a Mustang. Every, everything else is, is different. Different, wow. Same technology, but the parts are only five. The canopies are different. We didn't have any canopies. So I figured we were gonna have to make canopies for, for, for scratch. The airplane that, that had fatally crashed in Alaska, in Fairbanks, Alaska, right south of Ladd Air Force Base, was about a mile inland where we could land next to the river where the blaze of the helicopter would not hit trees. So we landed there. Now what were the chances of landing on that spot compared to anywhere else in a big circle? So we landed there and I would drop I dropped colored tape on the top of the wispy trees where the wreck site was. It was found there by Dick Odgers many years earlier. Crashed there in, in 1949. It crashed there in 1949. So anyway, I'd stop and I'd spread the trees and see the yellow tapes. Compasses don't work up there. So I'm walking in, and I'm about halfway in, about a quarter of a mile in, three, you know, half a mile in, I come across a jettison canopy where one pilot tried to get out. What were the chances? 
Then, 1953, when they, when they were doing away with the 82 from North American at, the, at Anglewood, the head design person says, take all this microfish for the V25, the Mustang, and the T82, and bring it outside and burn it in that 55-gallon drum. The man took it, instead of burning it, put it in the trunk of his airplane, or trunk of his car, and sold it to Lowell Ford in California, who presented me with the plans. It just goes and goes and goes and goes like that. If this wasn't true, I'd say you made it all up. <laughs> yeah. ah. so, it just, what, so at some point, you have to take all of these pieces and make this airplane. How long a process was that? That was 11 and, year, 11 and a half years and 209,000 man and woman hours. Man. And uh, a number of my employees and volunteers are here. We had a lot of volunteers. Hey, well, raise your hands. <laughs> Everybody who worked on this project, raise your hands. So Yeah. And <laughs> the Supplatas. So, so uh, we had an eight-person we had an eight-person paid airframe power plant IA inspection authorization crew. And we worked on it for full time for 11 and a half years. How much of this doing this is passion and how much is obsession? Uh, that's hard to answer, but, but uh, I've been in the business my 48th year now. Yeah. And I, I love building airplanes that people say can't be done. And we had a pile of wreckage out of Alaska, and they looked at that, so there was nothing there usable. I said, oh, yeah, it is. A lot of it's copyable. You know, we, we spent a huge amount of money for non-destructive inspection for X-ray and Magnaflux and paying machinists to make new parts and stuff like that. We always knew I, I always knew I would get it done. It's just how much time and how much money. So uh, in the process of putting it all together, uh, were there moments when you started to think, uh-oh, we finally have hit a stumbling block here and we can't get past that? Never. My gosh. Never. The, the biggest, one of the biggest problems was, was I had 20 plus pilots call me and they said, we want to fly the airplane. We want to be the first to fly. Now, I've flown Mustangs, but I'm not qualified to fly an 82. From the very beginning, I chose Red, Ray Fowler. Everybody else go, yeah, but we have this, we have... No, I'm choosing Ray Fowler. He will be the pilot. That was it. Now, why is that? And th this is terrific because this will tell you about Ray Fowler. Why Ray, Fa Ray Fowler? Well, the only thing he hasn't flown yet is a space shuttle. It's <laughs> <laughs> not true. He flies everything. And he's one of the most experienced pilots in a Mustang. You know, he flies Corsair, B-17, B-24, FW-190, P-38, on and on and on, and there's probably 50 Cessna airplanes. Cessna 182. Uh, P-82. <laughs> so I, I made a lot of people up happy, unhappy because uh, I made the decision from the very beginning it was going to be Ray Fowler. I don't care what you say, it's going to be Ray Fowler. That's it. Right. And, and that's what it was. As a matter of fact, Ray, was that you <coughs> flying the film we saw earlier on the jump? You were that was two days ago, yes. Oh, yeah. that was here. Yeah, that yeah. was here. Oh. He's the only P-82 pilot in the world now. But there's only one P-82, so there's not a big demand for us. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, we, have a, we now have a 28 hours on the airplane. A little over 20, I think. So we're 28 hours and about 25 landings. And uh, it's been amazingly squawk-free. Except for we had a little small hydraulic leak in here this morning that we're addressing. You saw us in there working on it. Right. Let well, me back up for just a second. Bud Anderson, whom everybody here knows and who is here with us all week, where does Bud come into this from his test career? Well, he flew one. He flew this very airplane. Uh, he flew this very airplane. A uh, small world. I dude. can't tell you when, but uh, the, the first 22 were stateside. This is the second, but the first to fly. They were held stateside as trainers and stuff like that. Uh, there, so, but the, uh, the, the other prototype went to uh, um, the big place on the East Coast, 
Norfolk. Norfolk. Norfolk yeah, or there. Virginia Beach. And it was scrapped in 53. But huh. because of the Sopladas, this and many other airplanes survived. So what did Bud have to say about his memory of testing this airplane? It's fast. <laughs> it's just strange because you're in the left seat flying and you look to the right and there's another fuselage over there you can have a midair. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's fast, it's heavy. It's heavier on the controls than the Mustang, but Ray can tell you all about that. Right, right. So what happened? Was it uh, last December 31st? Was that the day? December 31st. Uh, Just recent, <clears throat> twelve thirty-one. yeah. I knew what was going to fly, and he knew it was going to fly. <laughs> I hoped it was going to fly. Yeah, and uh, it was a cold day. And I said to him, now, I where said, you do, where was this? This in Douglas, Georgia. It's where I'm based. I was in Kissimmee, Florida, and Hurricane Charlie had different ideas. There's Pat Harker sitting right there. Raise your hand, pack. He's doing a magnificent job on an F-82 E model yeah. right there. I just noticed him right there. Pat has, Pat has been very helpful to us because he had a complete airplane, and he would allow us to come up and take measurements and, and copy things and so forth like that. Without him, we'd be far behind where we are now. Thank you. So, anyway, um, so anyway, we were. I said to Ray, I said, do a high-speed taxi. We have 6,000-foot runway. Uh, we have a 6,000-foot runway, but if you think it's marginal, go. And and uh, I watched it, it lifted off in less than 2,000 feet, and I was going to put it back down again. I went, he's not going to stop, and he flew. <laughs> wow. Went around the pat patch a couple of times. And so was the FAA involved in any of this, or are you pretty oh, yeah. much on your own? Yeah. We or were the FAA to... was involved? Oh, yeah. We were supposed to be here last year, but because of FAA, I shouldn't say delays, they're busy. And thanking us for the FAA it makes makes us all safe. Yeah. But uh, 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 Al Kimball, who was my principal maintenance uh, maintenance guy out of Orlando, watching what I do in Kissimmee, so I knew him, and he became the DAR designated aviation representative to license the airplane. So uh, he got busy and couldn't get there on time because he was busy with other things. And we finally got a license the day before Oshkosh, 2018. We did not have time to do all the test flying, which all went very well, do the test flying, and Ray is busy flying F-16s and flying for Delta and flying other warbirds. And so there's problems, you know, uh, time frame there. So we didn't make 2018. So we're 51 late weeks late, or 51 weeks <laughs> late for 2018. Right. So on that day, Ray, you get in the cockpit on last day of the year, and what happened? Well, it was a very nice day to go down. And like Tom saying, the airplane was ready. Um, there was so much that went into it. And every time we went down to, to prepare for the flights, uh, it was a little bit of a sideshow. So we had so many people. Obviously, it's a huge worldwide interest when this airplane was going to fly. I know uh, a lot of pressure on the for people to get it flying. So uh, on that day when we came down, we knew we had an airplane ready to go. Um, you know, we wanted the people to be there to see it fly, but uh, so everything had to be right. So really, we just went down with the intent to get some more uh, taxi time on the airplane. But uh, if, if all the stars aligned, which it did, um, I knew once I pushed the power up on that, uh, you know, once I set the power, I knew I was going to go fly on that day. And so, and it did just beautifully and obviously very short flight. Uh, so we did the first official flight actually in January, but it was nice to get some air under it, and uh, it was a huge momentum to take us into the really the first official flight, uh, which we invited everybody down to come see. So uh, even though, uh, you know, I think amongst our camp, we knew the airplane was probably going to get some air under it that day. It, uh, it worked out real well. What is that like for you when you, as a test pilot, the first time, the first flight thing? Um, what is that like for an aviator? To get on an airplane and really not know for sure that it's going to fly. Well, a lot of t airplanes that I've test flown are airplanes that other people have flown. So um, it, it's hard to speak to an airplane like this to where there's just not a lot of data. And I say not a lot of data. Obviously, it was an approved flying airplane. There's a flight manual. You really have all the information right there in front of you, which is great. And 
but Anderson was wonderful. Uh, we talked to the people with the commemorative Air Force that actually had one. So the last flying F-82 uh, was flew in the early 80s, and uh, that airplane is the one that's sitting in the Dayton Museum right now, never to fly again, unfortunately. So uh, there were a few people. <clears throat> one guy's named Ronnie Gardner. He actually flew. He's a guy that actually flew that airplane uh, back in the 80s, and so I was able to get some information before I got into it. Um, however, the uh, but to answer your question, it's so you, this one is so unique. Um, whenever you get into the airplane, it, it really, you know, certainly a great background airplane, the T-6, the P-51, a lot of the other warbirds kind of prepares you. But uh, when you strap on two airplanes, it, uh, it is a different experience. So explain that. You said it's unique. In what way? Well, obviously, everyone looks at it and says, man, you know, that, I think it's the number one question. Like, what cockpit do you choose to fly from? <laughs> well, uh, you actually solo the airplane from the left cockpit. Um, and like with the FAA, you were talking about, you know, even from the FAA standpoint, since there's no one qualified, there's no instructors qualified, there's really nobody, they, they have to kind of scratch their head and go to the deepest end of the regulations to find a one-of-a-kind airplane. So whenever they blessed me to go fly the airplane, since it is a new rebuild, you have to go straight into the flight testing program, which is the phase one testing. Um, However, usually you would have somebody come test fly your airplane that's already qualified in it. So you have no one qualified. You have to do the phase one testing, and those rules are pretty specific. You can't train. Uh, in fact, the running joke was even at the end of our test phase, which, like Tom said, went incredibly well. In fact, the FA uh, was going to work to actually lower the number of hours we needed because the, air, the, the flight testing went so well. Uh, we actually went to the end of the test phase anyway. It just worked out in the hours. But... Um, at the end of that phase, I was still not uh, a, a P-82 pilot. You know, I'm, I'm still playing one on television, right? Uh, because from a regulation standpoint, now I have to go out and train myself in the airplane, single-seat airplane, and then have somebody else come in and evaluate me fly it to prove that I can actually fly it. So um, it is quite a process. Um, but, you know, again, as we, you know, when you ask about the flight characteristics and the testing, it is... It is unbelievably unique just from a standpoint of taxiing, and I would say that is the biggest challenge uh, when you taxi. And, of course, you see how wide the gear is. I don't even know how wide the gear is. You probably know how wide it is, Tom, but it's wide. So when you're taxiing down your normal-sized taxiway, if you decide to taxi in the middle and you're sitting in the left fuselage, that will put that wheel off in the dirt. Uh, so it's something you kind of make the center line a brick wall, and you uh, just have to taxi on the little sit skinny uh, taxiway on the left to, to keep this airplane just on the taxiway so that's very unique with your incredible amount of experience flying so many different kinds of airplanes do you get nervous i mean were you quote uh, what we think of as nervous it may be ignorance i don't know uh i probably should have been nervous but not really you know i know uh the level of uh, detail and the amount of checks and rechecks and everything that Tom and his team does. Um, you know, it's kind of like a NASCAR pit stop. You know, I land with the airplane to have the smallest little issues, and these guys are on it. And they're not just on it, but they're on it after a 14-hour, 15-hour day, you know. So the thing that you guys don't see is uh, down in Douglas, Georgia, when there's no people that, you know, after we got done with the day, and I'm going home because I'm tired, and I didn't do anything other than go fly around in an airplane for for an hour and a half. But these guys started in the morning, they start in the evening. So that uh, that really makes it, uh, I think that makes the confidence a lot better. And, and when you look at the flight characteristics with this airplane compared to the P-51, some of the other airplanes, it's quite docile, actually. It, uh, it's very surprising on some of the things it does really well. How similar is the cockpit and how it's all set up compared to a Mustang? Uh, I'd say pretty similar. I mean, most people can see, and I'm glad they put the two airplanes together because I knew nothing about... Uh, an XP-82 when I went down to fly it. So, um, you know, the first thing you do when you walk up to it is you uh, you know, see how much bigger it is. I mean, the thing is a monster. So I'm used to just jumping up on the wheel and jumping up on the wing. So this thing you pull up with your ladder to climb up on it first off. Um, but it, it's just a uh, – in the cockpit, it's very – feels very Mustang. There's just – there's a few differences, but uh, you kind of – once you get in the air, you kind of pretend that other airplane's not attached to you, and it uh, – uh, and it kind of feels, looks and feels like a Mustang. In fact, if you take the pictures, you know, when I'm flying around with my iPhone taking pictures, um, if you don't take a picture over to the right, you'd never know you were in a P-82. It just looks like a short so Mustang. So did you have your iPhone out taking pictures that first flight? That, oh, of course. <laughs> no, I was quite focused on uh, just 
not making the news in a bad way for that. <laughs> but right. uh, but again, it uh, it flies very well, and uh, the flight characteristics will surprise you on some of the stuff that we could talk about on how it flies. So uh, when you release the brakes, power brakes, what happened? What so it goes it. it goes straight as an arrow. So in, you know, in the P fifty one, everybody talks about the P factor and the torque and how you have to be gentle with the throttle. And, the, and that is a true statement. You got a uh, eleven foot prop swing, swing in there. So a lot of characteristics working against you to uh, to let you wreck it on a takeoff or landing. This is much like a, a jet. You know, both propellers are counter rotating. So you know, I look down uh, with. However many, uh, how much time I have in a Mustang, you know, and you have your rudder trim set for right rudder trim, six degrees right rudder trim. Well, you look down at this one, it's zero. So I have to resist the urge to put in rudder trim. It, it is zero. It, everything's zeroed out. So it, uh, it's much like a jet. You push the power up. It goes straight as an arrow. Um, you know, it's a little different managing the engines uh, and man managing two Merlins. But, uh, again, it goes, it's like a dart. It goes, uh, goes very straight. And, um, so what happened? You rolled down the runway, and what happened? Well, I rolled down the runway on that. Like I said, at that point, you know, where where I had picked a go no go. So all of our high speed taxis are relatively short time. So, uh, you know, I knew if I put air under the airplane, I was going to fly it around the airport. So that there was really not a contingent for putting it back on the ground to stop. Um, so uh, literally, it just accelerated. You know, I looked down and I'm at flying speed, and I still, you know, I'm like, man, I, and it's a beautiful day. Let's let's go fly. Two things, sir. Two things you forgot to mention: the left-hand turning engine, which is, you know, right there. That's a left-hand turn. They're counter-rotating propellers. That was found brand new in a box, brand new in a garage in New Mexico City. How did it get there? We have no idea. There were only 40 of those engines ever built. 22 of them went on B went on the XP and the B models, the so 22 Merlin-powered ones. Of course, the rest of them were Allison-powered. So there was 18 remaining, and one of them ended up in Mexico City. What did, how in heaven's name did you find it? Well, uh, Vintage V12s found it. Vintage V12s built both these engines, and MT Propellers did a wonderful job on the propellers. And uh, uh, that's, uh, I was buying another left-hand turning core and sending it to somebody for overhaul, and I get this phone call from Mike Nixon, all out of breath, he says, I found a brand new engine. Where? In a garage in Mexico City. Huh? <laughs> I said, did you buy it? He said, yeah, of course I bought it. I said, okay, it's mine. Now, he, he, even though it was brand new, it still had to be over, overhauled. So, when he kicked off the brakes, and all of a sudden was zooming out down the runway, and went airborne, what was going through your head? And heart, maybe. Well, another, another airplane completed. Another Just completed. That, and I came back and I said, any squawks? She said, no. I went, amazing. So so what? Uh, how much testing did you do on it, Ray? Quite a bit. We've done uh, quite a bit of testing. Uh, of course, he's been the only pilot always. I've taxied to the airplane, and so has Max Hodges. I don't know where he is. He's somewhere in here. I don't. I don't know where he is. He's one of our uh, other uh, pilots. He flies in the right-hand seat, and uh, he's spent. Can most you fly this from the right seat? This is this, this is two controls. The first twenty-two airplanes is, are full dual controlled. The only thing the person in the right seat cannot do is cannot put the landing gear up, and does not have aileron trim. He has everything else. Oh. Well. So. Uh, now, the 23rd airplane through the 272 had a large radar pod hanging under the metal. You see the big hook in the middle there? Yeah. That holds the radar pod. And he was a weapon systems officer, or a WIZO, as we call them. In the right hand seat, he had a radar screen. So he'd talk to the pilot and tell him where to shoot. Right. So, where to go. Uh, but one other thing we did, uh, one of the big glitches that we had is when I was here a year ago, we watched the Tiger Cat have the wheel failure. Now, the two original wheels, and they're 3288 wheels, it's, it's quite a rare wheel. There are no other new wheels existing anywhere in the world. So uh, I had two wheels that were in real nice shape, and they were, they were already had a yellow tag, and they were approved for flight, but they had microscopic little pits where the steel snap ring goes in to hold the wheel together. 
I looked at the tiger cat, had the wheel failure, and I went, huh. So I went around trying to find new wheels, couldn't find them. So I talked to a man, uh, uh, a truck wall in California, and he builds, specializes in building wheels. So that took us five months and a couple dollars to get new wheels made. So that delayed our flight for five months. Ray, when will we see this airplane fly? So we're scheduled tomorrow to fly. It uh, may fly this evening, uh, but uh, tomorrow it's scheduled in the show. And uh, we flew it in the show on Tuesday, uh, even though we didn't get to, uh, they kind of cut us short uh, based on their timing. They got a little behind in the show, which is a shame. But uh, we got to go fly with a B-29, which was, I think, what most people wanted to see uh, while they were here. But uh, we, I had a great view of it because we went and did a photo shoot with the B-29. But, uh, but hopefully you guys will see it tomorrow, and we may fly it this evening based on the weather. And with B-20, did you take some stills in the car? Of course. Oh, good, good. Okay. Yeah, no, it was great. No, uh, the photographers did. I've already seen one picture. I think they put it out on the EA uh, website, and it's a beautiful shot. It's very unique. Ladies and gentlemen, Tom Riley and Ray Fowler. <laughs> and now, welcome Sam Bass. 50 years of, of safe flying, over 35,000 hours in the cockpit. Ray's going to come out and start talking details of the airplane with these two gentlemen. Ray. Well, we really don't have too much to say because you've covered it very well. <laughs> <laughs> you've done a great job there. But, uh, Ray, the, the, the airplane was designed, as you, as you said, to, to go along for the B-29 for in Tokyo. And it obviously missed that. And it actually the only combat was in korea how do you feel that it fit, uh, served that purpose in korea uh, i think it served it unbelievably well except for it was designated as a night fighter so you know when i'm flying it in the day which is uh, interesting i cannot imagine strapping this thing on at night and uh, flying it as a night fighter and i think a lot of the combat losses were just controlled flight into terrain uh, where uh, you can imagine raging around in the hills in korea you know at nighttime trying to uh, do good work but, uh, but the one thing I will say, and this is interesting about this airplane and for all the multi-engine pilots out there, um, when they made the uh, change of the firewall switch when the airplane would not fly. So originally, uh, the engineers figured out, you know, I'm sure it was quite embarrassing whenever they went down the runway and pulled back on the original prototype and it would not fly. Uh, they got the bright idea just to move firewall forward. They just took one engine to the left, the other one to the right, uh, which basically turned it into... A, a totally different docile airplane so like Tom was talking about both engines rotate in so really effectively it removes uh, on the, makes it almost centerline thrust so I wouldn't have believed it if I haven't done it in this airplane but everybody asks it's obviously very high performance but what's the blue line so what can you fly with one engine or one engine shut down this airplane you can have one engine uh, at full power you can have the other one windmilling not even feathered and you can go full do full stalls uh, which so there is no blue line it will stall well before and it's very docile in fact when you're coming downhill if you lose an engine you probably never even know it so when uh, when we've done the engine shutdowns you put very little bit of rudder trim it's just a very docile airplane for that reason in fact whenever you're going around corners it more pulls you forward than any asymmetry on the uh, taxi so just a unbelievably unique airplane in that regard well I've known Ray maybe since he was 18 years old he knocked on my door one time, and he was trying to get next door to get his first Warbird ride. But anyway, <laughs> Ray, now I know that you did a lot of preparation before this first flight, and you being a close friend of Bud, I'm sure you called him. What did Bud tell you? <laughs> it's funny. Well, I think most people heard the story. So uh, I asked Bud his impressions of the uh, XP-82. And, of course, his impression was it's one of the worst fighters ever built. And, of course, he's comparing that against the P-51, which is so nimble. This airplane was really designed to do one thing really well, which was go long distances. And it's such a heavy airplane with the internal fuel. So uh, he's also comparing this airplane. This one is built just like the XP-82. So all the improvements that went from the XP into the F-82s with the hydraulically boosted controls, uh, they gave some improvements on the hydraulic system for the accumulator. So Tom has stayed pretty much totally pure to this airplane in the way it would have flown in the, uh, in the, as the XP program flew. Uh, 
you know, to include certain things other than the avionics. He did give uh, me a really nice uh, GPS so I don't get lost. So that's embarrassing. But, uh, but yeah, it flies. Uh, what you see is pretty much exactly uh, how you would have seen it as it flew as an XP-82. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, both of you. It's been a great pleasure just to listen to it. And we've got a little time here for some questions and answers. Anybody up there? I'm sure there's lots of people. Well, just a minute. He'll give you a mic. I think, Tom, you had mentioned at one time the woman wouldn't sell you the plane. or I, I don't know what the, what happened to the parts. It, so he came back and bought something, but the, she said she had sold it. Whatever happened to that parts of the uh, Mustang 82? The first uh, project that you weren't able to buy from Walter, where did the first project go? Oh, the first project went to Pat Horker, right there. Yeah. Put your hand up. He has the E-model, right there. This is the second project I had, which no, none of us knew that it existed. Over here. Good morning. Uh, I'd like to say thank you for bringing this wonderful airplane out. It's uh, probably the coolest thing, in my opinion, that's here right now. So thanks again for the effort that goes into you know, keeping these things flying. Um, my question is in regards to the single engine Mustangs, is there a reason North American changed the glove angle uh, on the later Mustangs as compared to the earlier ones? Are you talking about the H model? So this was actually uh, patterned after the H model. So if you saw the H, if it's still here, in fact, it was on the alley. It's uh, yeah, so you've got to look at that airplane. I think that's the only one flying, or H. There's like one or two that fly. So there were improvements. Uh, I think... What makes a Mustang really look sexy with the lines and everything else, they kind of took all that out of the H model. So uh, the H is, is an unbelievable performer because it's so much lighter. Uh, but it, you know, again, that one looks a lot better than the H, but this was patterned after the H model. Now, why they took that out engineering, I'm sure it's a, probably a little more efficient. This was really a high, spe uh, a high altitude, high speed escort airplane. There's probably some efficiencies in there that they did that, but that's a smart engineer question. Thank you. Next. Thank you. You mentioned that the um, uh, first three kills in Korea was done by the uh, uh, the 82. Uh, the very first one was Charlie Moran, who was from Horse Cave, Kentucky, my hometown. So oh, good very deal. Cool. Thanks. Wow. Yeah, shot down a Yak 11, I think it was, or Yak 9, one of the Yaks. So very cool. Next has a significantly smaller rudder than the B-51. And it's an all-metal rudder, where the 51s were all all fabric. Is this the first fighter to have all-metal control surfaces? I don't know. That I one. think so. So with the P-51, you know, they had a harmonic. They actually had one on the early P-51s. They tested it with a uh, metal rudder. And uh, if you can, when you're flying next to it, you'll see the rudder moving. So there's a harmonic that uh, sets up with this airplane that I'm assuming that they don't have on this one. But it is smaller, but you have two of them. So uh, it's quite effective. They work really well. Over here first. How does this compare flying the P-38, which is twin engine? Uh, that's a real good question. So the P-38 is, is a totally different animal. Um, so it, uh, I would say the visibility is a lot better out of this airplane than the P-38. Um, that is the one airplane that both engines rotate out. So both engines are critical, um, but also a very big, the P-38 is a fighter, but it flies much like a B-25. In fact, when you get in that airplane, it, it feels like a, uh, and it's a very heavy airplane to fly. But this one, I would say, is easier to fly than a P-38, uh, particularly um, the way that they manage the fuel system in that airplane. There's there's some other issues with that uh, that make that a little more challenging in this airplane. They just, they had got this one figured out. They had put a lot more technology into, which would be, you know, uh, later 40s technology into this airplane to fly into the 50s. That's one other thing that, as a matter of fact, is we text Ray the other night. We were talking about minimum, minimum control speed in the air, which Tom would be very familiar with. Almost every multi-engine airplane, it, it has some minimum con control speed that you have to be above that if you lose an engine that you're able to control the airplane. Ray texted us back and he says it doesn't have any VMCA. And I had never and heard. And the P thirty eight certainly does that. And that I had never heard critical. of a of a multi engine airplane that didn't have that. Yeah. Now we have another question here. I actually had the same question about how it uh, performs 
compared to a P38. So instead, I'll just ask, what's the fastest you've had it? Uh, so this one we've had a little over 400, you know, and I've had the same with the P38 well, over 400. You know, this one I've had to over 500, so it'll effortlessly go to 505 uh, miles an hour. Um, the biggest thing, too, we talk about the, uh, like Bud talking about this airplane being so heavy to fly. So, um, you know, whenever Pat has his airplane flying, he'll have the hydraulics in it. And so I'm sure it'll be a lot more finger light, uh, you know, for a 19,000 pound airplane, which is still relatively light compared when they put the tanks and they put the bombs and put the rockets and I bet it was a total pig uh, back in Korea whenever they would load it with a combat load. But uh, if you turn the hydraulics off in the P-38, it turns from a fighter into a dump truck, basically, to go fly. Uh, so you know, much like this airplane, too, it's uh, just like your Cessna or Piper, it's cable-driven. So uh, when you get into the P-51 after flying this one, this one's quite light on the controls, as you can imagine. But this one is still... You know, very honest. You know, I take off, I turn it loose, and when I'm taking my pictures, and mm -hmm. it kind of flies itself. Uh, Over here? Yes, uh, with the dual fuse latches, is there any torsional twist, and can you feel it? There is nothing. This, like I said, counter rotating, everything is equal. It's straight as an arrow. And uh, I, I will bring up a couple things that I didn't say, which is very unique about the airplane. So we talked about the taxi, but, uh, you know, the running joke is that. Uh, you're the best formation pilot in the world because you're flying always flying off yourself. But that being said, when you're looking through the fuselage at another airplane, you got to remember you are flying off of yourself. So <laughs> you got to make sure you keep an eye on the other airplane because you kind of have to resist the urge to look through that other airplane. Um, but yeah, it's uh, once I get in the air, I kind of just pretend that airplane's not attached to me anymore. It seems to work out pretty well. I want to thank both of you, and uh, it's been a great day. We, as you know, this is brought to you by the Warbirds of America. We have our merchandise building behind here, and most of you, a lot of you think that we're all Warbird owners. Most of us are not. We would like to have your membership kind of support these people and uh, so that different people can see our different airplanes. But the Warbirds merchandise is right up behind us over here, and also we want to thank TV Flying, uh, the <laughs> FlyingTV.com for bringing this. Thank can you very much. Can I say okay. something real quick? Too? Yes, please. Also, and also, uh, if you haven't seen the uh, the manual that they have, or the the uh, what are they calling the thing, the uh, commemorative guide, you guys yeah, need to see that. Right. Uh, they've done such a beautiful job with that information. I don't know where they have it. It's but right I over here underneath the blue tin. I, so think, I think they have those that over here, and uh, it's so beautifully done. There we go. So see, uh, see this young lady there. I think they're. Ten dollars or something for that. Uh, flip through one, and if you see it, you'll, it'll be worth ten dollars. It's got uh, the story for all of the Warbirds in Review people for the week. Uh, thanks to Connie Bolin, obviously, that put this together. I know you uh, saw Connie at the beginning. We get to fly with her, and uh, again, thanks for having us. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming. Thank you, sir.